Stocks are not a surefire way to save your portfolio from the damages of inflation. At least they're not the 100% guaranteed inflation hedge that the financial media tries to tell you they are. And I'm going to explain this to you in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go back to when I was born. <laughs> the 1970s. This is a chart that starts about 1969, goes all the way to 1980. On the left, we go from 300 up to 800. This is a chart for the S&P 500, adjusted for inflation. It starts off over 800, and then you'll notice it comes crashing down the 1970s. The stock market then goes back up. In about 1972, it comes down again. And I want to point out, in fact, editor, go ahead and throw up a chart of the S&P in nominal terms. It went down by over 50%. Now, adjusted for inflation, of course, it went down even more. In other words, your purchasing power would have gone down by even more than the 50% the stock market went down in nominal terms because we had significant consumer price inflation at the same time. It recovers a bit, but then it comes down to the point in 1980 where it's dramatically lower than it was to start the decade, a decade of high rates of inflation. One of the reasons this happened is because interest rates were going up the whole time. Most of us know that. In other words, bond prices were going down. So just think what would have happened if you would have listened to the advice of your friend and family member Fred and this bearded gentleman right here with the beady little eyes, Mr. Portnoy, <laughs> holding a pizza, of course, and they're both telling you to buy the dip, buy the dip, buy the dip. What would have happened to your stocks and your bonds if you would have bought the dip in 1970 all the way to 1980. Your stock or your portfolio would have gone from here all the way down to here. And there's a few reasons why. And again, they start with interest rates. This decreases the rate of demand. It increases the debt costs for corporations. So when they have to roll over that debt, it's more expensive. That eats into profits. Corporate profits go down and the PE multiple, the price the market is willing to pay for those earnings decreases because the market expects the profits themselves to decrease in the future. But to understand why inflation going up, therefore interest rates can be so damaging to your stock portfolio, or your stonk, is that how you pronounce it? Stonk portfolio. <laughs> Editor, let's go right to the internet. Okay, this is straight from Investopedia. How interest rates affect the U.S. markets. First of all, higher interest rates mean consumers don't have as much disposable income and cut back on spending. And when we live in an economy that is debt-based and consumption-based, this has a huge impact. When higher interest rates are coupled with increasing lending standards, banks make fewer loans, or I would add, less demand for loans from the private sector because they just can't afford the payments with the new higher interest rates. This affects not only consumers, but businesses and farmers. I'm not sure why they threw in farmers. It's, <laughs> it's kind of odd, isn't it? Who cut back on spending for new equipment, thus slowing productivity, reducing the number of employees. The tighter lending standards also mean that consumers will cut back on spending, and this will affect many businesses' bottom lines. Now, you may be saying to yourself, okay, George, well, that would be deflationary. And typically it would be unless the government is creating so many dollars that it's compensating for the fewer dollars being produced by the commercial banking system. And when you couple that with fewer goods and services, you have consumer price inflation. So this creates far less economic output, a lot higher costs for businesses, 
a lot less income and therefore a lot less profit going to their bottom line. So just plain and simple, when interest rates are rising, both businesses and consumers will cut back on spending. Their costs will also go up. This will cause earnings to fall, therefore stock prices to drop. Not always, but this is what we saw happen in the 1970s. So there's a probability far above zero where we could see it happen in the 2020s as well. So the main takeaway from step number one that we've proven with this chart of the 1970s S&P 500 adjusted for inflation is that stocks are by no means a guaranteed hedge against consumer price inflation. Step number two, will the Fed peg the yield curve or artificially lower interest rates? Because I know a lot of you, probably most of you <laughs> during step number one, were saying, yeah, George, we get it, but the Fed is going to come in this time, unlike the 1970s, and they're going to keep interest rates at the long end of the yield curve, like the 10-year Treasury, as an example. They're going to keep those interest rates low. They're going to buy all those bonds. They're going to peg the yield curve they're going to do yield curve control. The Fed just won't allow interest rates to go up. They can't allow interest rates to go up because it'll destroy the economy, right? Well, I think a better question may be, can the Fed peg the yield curve? Here's what I'm talking about. Here's a chart, 2020 going all the way to today's date. The first one is everybody's favorite, the Fed's BS, that's right. And on the left, it goes from four trillion, which we thought was an astronomical number, up to where it is today, over eight trillion dollars. Woohoo! <laughs> I mean, the, the numbers just really don't matter anymore. Do they? Every single time I look at it, it says, wow, I, my, it just blows your mind. The next year, the Fed's balance sheet is 10 times higher or whatever it is. Well, it's quantitative easing, government deficit spending, who knows? But anyway, let's get back on track here, George. So the Fed's balance sheet increases like this because they're doing quantitative easing. They're doing that asset swap that Jeff Snyder always talks about where they're creating bank reserves, funny money, the Fed's dollars out of thin air and using those to buy treasuries or mortgage-backed securities from the commercial banks and the primary dealer banks under the Fed's umbrella. This has an explicit intent to lower interest rates. And we've heard the central banks talk about this all the time. Editor, throw up a clip of the Bank of England doing an actual YouTube video showing the reason they do QE is to try to keep interest rates low at the long end of the curve and in the real economy. When the bank buys assets, this increases their price and so reduces their yield. That means the return on those assets falls. This encourages the sellers of assets to use the money they receive from the bank to switch into other financial assets like company shares and bonds. As purchases of these other assets start to increase, their prices rise, which pushes down on yields generally. Lower yields reduce the cost of borrowing for businesses and households. This, in turn, leads to higher consumer spending and more investment. So, coming back to the chart, we know that right around March of 2020, the Fed started QE infinity. That's where their balance sheet skyrocketed and it's gone straight up since. This creates artificial demand for the bonds the Fed is buying. Bonds such as the 10-year treasury. So if the Fed is creating all of this artificial demand, buying billions and billions and billions of dollars, we would expect the price of those bonds to increase. In other words, the interest rates, like the Bank of England was saying, to go down. But let's look at a chart of the 10-year yield during the exact same time frame. 
2020, starting in March, going all the way to today's date. It's represented by this blue line. And you can see when we bottom out here, right about this same time in March, since then, interest rates have not gone down. As a matter of fact, they've done the complete opposite of that. They've gone straight up. Now, we have had a decline in the last few months since April of 2021. We'll get into that in just a moment. But the main point here is when the Fed comes in and does quantitative easing to explicitly lower interest rates, they do the exact opposite of that. Interest rates go up. Now, a lot of you may be saying to yourself, okay, George, I get it, but maybe it just happened this time. We had a lot of weird things going on, such as the Cerveza sickness, lockdowns, supply chain disruptions. Well, editor, go ahead and throw up a chart of the last three rounds of quantitative easing. QE1, you'll see interest rates went up. QE2, interest rates went up. QE3, interest rates went up. And now that they're doing QE infinity, we see the exact same thing happen. So we go back to the question of not will the Fed peg the yield curve, but can they peg the yield curve? Because if history is any indication, the answer would be no, they can't. Why? Because what happens when they start doing quantitative easing is the market expects inflation. Now, whether it's asset inflation, consumer price inflation, we don't know. There's a lot of market participants out there. But what we've seen since 2008, or since Ben Bernanke started QE, is that the market always wins. Now, I'm not saying that the Fed can't do it moving forward. We saw them peg the yield curve successfully in 1940, or throughout the 1940s. But what I am saying is since 2008, they haven't done it successfully. We've had the opposite happen. So to assume the Fed can achieve their objective or any objective for that matter, <laughs> I think is a big, big mistake. And these charts and the charts that the editor threw up illustrate this point perfectly. Now, I'm sure a lot of you right about now are kind of scratching your head and saying, okay, George, I understand what you're saying, that the market expects inflation to go up, but this line, starting in April of 2021, where the interest rates are going back down, therefore the prices of the 10-year treasuries are going back up, would imply that the market is saying that they think there's a higher probability we actually have deflation moving forward, or maybe disinflation would be a better word. And then you go down to your local grocery store or you buy anything and the prices have gone up significantly over the last year and it really doesn't add up. It doesn't make any sense. How on earth can the market see a higher probability of deflation when you see consumer price inflation all around you. I think one of the main keys to understanding this dynamic is having a better idea of how the market itself works. I think when I read my comments and when I interact with people at Rebel Capitalist Live or on my live streams, I think a lot of people have the tendency to see the market as though it's just one group of individuals making the exact same decision. So as an example, if this circle is a representation of the bond market or the stock market or any market for that matter, we see it as if the price is going up, that means that everyone in the market is bullish and buying. It's just a matter of to what degree are they buying and that's what makes the price move up or move way up. And it's the exact same thing if the price is going down. We have kind of have this tendency to think that everyone is now on the bearish side of the market and they're all selling. And the rate at which the price goes down is strictly determined by how much those individuals are actually selling. 
but that's not the way a market works. I think it's far better to look at it as a group of a thousand individuals, like we've got right here. And we could have 501 of those individuals be bullish and 499 of those individuals bearish and the market would still go up. And the opposite is true. If we just have 501 of those individuals on the sell side and 499 on the buy side, then the market will go down. So it's not as though the entire market has one opinion. It's a very slight and subtle change, or it can be a very slight and subtle change. And sometimes it can be a significant change. Sometimes it could be 750 and 250, which would create an environment like we saw in March of 2020, where the market is going straight down and going down very, very quickly. This is why a lot of times when you used to see Jim Rogers on CNBC, they'd ask him why the market is going up. And he'd simply look at them and say, because there's more buyers than sellers. And sometimes we have to understand that. Now to illustrate this point even further, let's think about when these rates are going up. In other words, there are more sellers in the market. The prices are going down. This consumer price inflation fear that we were talking about in the market is more prevalent. Let's say there's the average Joe that's looking at that quantitative easing and saying, oh my gosh, here comes the inflation. I better sell my bonds. But at a certain point, the hedge fund managers come in, let's say. So right here, we have this individual. His name is Hedge Fund Harry, we'll call him. And, and trust me, I tried to think of another H so I could call him Triple H, one of my favorite wrestlers, one of the best of all times, Triple H and D-Generation X, that's right. But I could only think of two, so we'll call him Double H. So Double H comes in and he's a market participant. He's one of these individuals or one of those individuals. And he says, okay, I get it. The consumer price inflation is going up, but... I'm looking at some other charts like M2 money supply or the money supply, the dollars as measured by the Fed circulating in the economy. And I see that plateauing. I see that flattening out. And then I see what's happening in April with reverse repo. And I know that that's taking reserves out of the system. And that adds a little more strength to that deflationary tailwind. And remember, we never ever have just inflation or just deflation. They're like two tectonic plates that are always competing. So it's not that we have inflation or deflation. They're happening simultaneously. It's just a matter of who is currently winning the tug of war. So going back to my point, as the rates are going up or there's more sellers, this could be because the 501 individuals have more fear of consumer price inflation. But when prices are going up, in other words, interest rates going down, this could be because the hedge fund managers now represent 501 individuals in the market or their, their capital flows, let's say. They see an opportunity for capital gains. So they could care less about consumer price inflation. They know the prices at the grocery store are going up but they don't care because they're not buying a 10-year treasury to hold it for 10 years. They're buying it just to flip it in two or three months. And if they see a quick opportunity to make a buck, they'll go ahead and do it because they see M2 leveling off or the money supply, the dollar supply leveling off. They see the reverse repo and they see the government coming to a stalemate. And you guys know my opinion. I think we've gone from a Fed put to a government put, meaning that the market or the majority of the participants in the market are now relying on government spending to support the economy as opposed to the Fed. In other words, they're relying on fiscal policy more than they are relying on monetary policy. So the main takeaways from step number two, one is the Fed may or may not 
be able to control interest rates at the long end of the yield curve. And if they can't control interest rates and we see consumer price inflation continuing to go up, at a certain point, we could see a 1972 to 1974 in the stock market today, where even though we have consumer price inflation going up, stocks are going straight down. And number two, there are several market participants always on both sides. And sometimes the market or yields can go up for one reason and down for a completely different reason that has nothing to do whatsoever with the rate of inflation. Step number three, a herd mentality, or maybe better said, a herd investment strategy may exacerbate a black swan event. This is another reason why I think stocks, if you're depending on them to save you from inflation, you could be making a very big mistake. And this goes back to a conversation that I had with my good buddy, Chris Cole, with Artemis Capital. He is definitely one of the smartest guys out there. And if you haven't heard Chris speak on diversification, the Dragon portfolio, you're definitely missing out. So check out a lot of his free research and papers at artemiscm.com for Artemis Capital Management. It's all free research, so there's no reason to not go there and check it out. And these pie charts that I'm using are directly from Chris's website. So the point that he made in our conversation and the point that he makes on his website is that most investors think they're extremely diversified. So we go back to the average Joe and even Double H himself, the quote unquote pros. They think that they're very diversified in their investment strategies. You see now in step number two, we were talking about the market, how it's never the entire group on one side or the other. But I'm kind of throwing you a curveball here because although this may be true, when you're looking at an individual asset, as far as the strategies go, that are, or the strategies that are deployed, this can be true where everyone is on one side of the boat. Let me explain further. Most individuals that would have this diversified portfolio, let's say they're investing in value stocks, global macro, all of these strategies, growth stocks, risk parity. We've heard that all the time. The 130-30 type of fund, or maybe even some real estate stocks, maybe some private equity. And to do all this, of course, they're doing what? Dollar cost averaging. So they can sleep well at night knowing that they're doing the smart thing. Because like Jim Cramer says, the only free lunch on Wall Street is diversification. <laughs> but what Chris Cole teaches us is that Joe and Triple H aren't even close to diversified. That's why I put this, not. <laughs> Remember that? Someone's got to bring that back. That was like the best thing ever when I was growing up. So you go to your buddies, your friend and family member, Fred, and the next time they tell you, hey, I'm diversified, just say, not, and then send them to Chris Cole's website, or better yet, this video. <laughs> but what they don't realize is they're really invested in only one strategy, or let's say 95% of their portfolio is one strategy and one strategy only. So if that strategy doesn't pay off, you or your friend and family member Fred, the average Joe and Double H, are going to lose significant amounts of purchasing power. And most of you know exactly what I'm referring to. And that's that the average investor, even the pros, 95% of their portfolio is short volatility. An editor 
Let's go ahead and throw up the chart that we used in step number one of the stock market. And you can see in the 1970s, it was incredibly volatile, not only in the stock market, but let's look at a chart of interest rates. Those were extremely volatile as well. We think of the 1970s as a decade where interest rates just go straight up, but that wasn't the case at all. If you look at it from the beginning to the end, yes, they went up, but they sure as heck did not go up in a straight line. And the stock market did not go down in a straight line adjusted for the consumer price inflation. So another way to think about this is the majority of capital that's out there is long 1981 to today. But it's short 1970s. And because our economy is so much more financialized than it was in the 1970s, there's so much more capital at play, at risk, that short a black swan type of event. And maybe that black swan type of event isn't necessarily stagflation in and of itself, but maybe the black swan event is when the market realizes that the Fed might not control the long end of the yield curve. The Fed has painted themselves into a corner where they can't control interest rates, but they and the government need to continue to create more and more dollars to prop up the economy. That's when we could see a stock market event like we had from 1972 to 1974, where it went down by 50% in nominal terms. But I think it could be exacerbated as far as the move down in the stock market because of what we're pointing out here in step number three. We have far more capital at play and it is all on one side of the boat as far as a strategy. So if we don't have 1981 to today, meaning very low volatility, if we do have the 1970s type of extremely high volatility, we could see the stock market collapse by even more than 50%. And I wanna be very clear, when I do these videos, this one included, I'm not predicting inflation. I'm not predicting deflation. I'm not even predicting a stock market collapse. What I am doing is trying to explain the market, the dynamics, and how they have worked over history so you can understand the probabilities better and make better financial decisions for your future. So I know a lot of you right now are saying, okay, Jordan, you've pointed out the risks. I get it, but what should we do if we don't want to be short volatility with 95% of our portfolio? If we understand the concepts you're trying to explain in this video, what should we do? I can't give you any personal investment advice, but I can tell you what the smartest guys and gals that I know do consistently. Whether they're the individuals that you see on Real Vision, on Macro Voices, or maybe even on the Rebel Capitalist Show, the one thing they all have in common is they own gold. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here and I'll see you on the next video.